Um, so when people tell me they're not worried about climate change, I like to tell them about my polar expedition. In 2010, I went on a life-changing adventure. I won a scholarship that allowed me to partake on an expedition to Canada's north. And for 18 days, I sailed along the east coast of Baffin Island, which is just above the province of Quebec. I was traveling with an organization called Students on Ice that brings students to the Arctic every summer on educational expeditions. Aboard my ship were 80 students from around the world and 20 experts in polar issues. Every day I was in the Arctic was an adventure. We went on breathtaking hikes, saw beautiful wildlife, and these are pictures I took myself just so you can get an idea of how close we were getting to some of these animals. <laughs> the walruses were pretty cool, but they did not smell very nice. We also visited Inuit communities where we got to learn about a very unique culture. My heart was completely captured by the North, and I can't wait to go back there. And in fact, I'm hoping to head back this summer. But I was also deeply worried by many things that I learned and saw, and I want to share these with you. This photo was taken in Iwetuk National Park. It's a beautiful valley carved by glaciers thousands of years ago. And in Anuktitut, the language of the Inuit, Iwetuk means the land that never melts. Iwetuk Park was evacuated in 2008 because there was so much flooding. The land that never melts was melting. And I don't know if you can see in this photo, there's a pile of dirt behind my head. Here it is up close. So I asked the glaciologist traveling with us, what is this? And he explained to me that this pile of dirt was left in the wake of a glacier as it melted. Climate change is changing the landscape of the north. It's also impacting the wildlife. So this here is not a penguin, it's a thick-billed bird. Uh, penguins live in Antarctica and polar bears live in the Arctic and that's where I was. And uh, the thick-billed bird is a pretty cool bird. It can fly, not very well. It kind of glides along and then plops into the ocean, but um, they were really beautiful, look a bit like puffins. And in order to eat, the thick-billed mer will jump onto ice floating in the ocean and it'll go fishing. Now when I was in the Arctic, we saw no ice in the ocean. And this was really unusual for the area we were in and for the time of year we were there. And I learned on my expedition that the ice in the Arctic Ocean is melting. And this means it's, become very, it's becoming very hard for the thick-billed myrrh to get enough to eat. Climate change is threatening the wildlife of the North. It's also impacting communities. Terrifying is the word that best describes the situation of a hunter who is lost on shifting ice, or of a homeowner whose house sinks under a breaking glacier. These are the words of Mary Simon, an Inuit leader who's quite renowned, and um, they highlight some of the impacts that the Inuit are experiencing because of climate change. There's one in particular I would like to speak about, which is the impact on hunting, because it shows just how broad the impacts of a warming climate are on these people. So, because of climate change, the animals that live in the north are disappearing or migrating, which means that the Inuit can no longer hunt them, and also the weather conditions are making it very dangerous to hunt. And this means that climate change is having cultural impacts, because it, the Inuit have hunted for hundreds and hundreds of years. It's part of their cultural identity, part of who they are. It also means that climate change is having health impacts, because the nutritional value of, a of food they might catch themselves is far higher than anything they'll get in a grocery store, which is often junk food. And also, hunting is one of the ways that Inuits stay active. So as fewer are hunting, more are becoming sedentary. Lastly, this means that climate change is having economic impacts. So because fewer Inuit are hunting, they need to buy more of their food at a grocery store. I know this doesn't sound like a big deal. Personally, I buy all my food at a grocery store, but this is a big deal because the food at northern grocery stores is extremely expensive. In fact, just to give you an idea, uh, when I was in the community that, where this photo was taken, a community called Cape Dorset, I went to a northern grocery store and I saw a box of popsicles for $60. Many Inuit can't afford these high food prices, and in fact, in our very own province, one in three Inuit children will experience hunger. Climate change is threatening the Inuit. So when I returned to Montreal, I wanted to tell other people what I had seen in the Arctic and what I had learned. 
I wanted to inspire them to care about this part of our country, and I wanted them to be incited to start taking action on climate change. I wanted to tell the world my story, and this summer I did. On June 10th, I boarded an airplane with 13 other students who had participated on expeditions with Students on Ice. But this summer, we were headed south to Rio. We were going to the Earth Summit. So the Earth Summit, which is also known as the Rio Plus 20 Conference, was the biggest conference in the history of the United Nations. And for three days, over 50,000 people from around the world gathered in Rio, and they were there to discuss the biggest challenges in sustainable development. And my delegation went to Rio because we wanted to make sure the people there were going to talk about the Arctic. Now I want to be clear about one thing, we didn't exactly know what we were doing. We were just a bunch of students with a big idea and a whole lot of passion. But none of us had ever planned conferences, uh, planned trips to UN conferences before. And none of us, or were, in fact very few of us had ever even traveled on our own. But when we were in Rio, we tried to tell as many people as we could about our passion for the Arctic, in hopes that we would inspire them to commit to protecting it. We also wanted to teach them about the challenges that the Arctic is facing. And we were lucky because there were an incredible amount of cool people in Rio that who we could talk to. So we spoke to environmental leaders like David Suzuki. We spoke to political leaders like the Prime Minister of Norway. And we spoke to students and activists from around the world who had gathered there in hopes of securing a better future for our planet. I want to tell you one story from Rio um, about my friend Minnie Molly, who's in the yellow dress in this photo. So Minnie Molly is a 17-year-old from a small Inuit community in northern Quebec, um, but she actually lives in Montreal now and goes to John Abbott College. And when we arrived in Rio, Minnie Molly learned that Jean Charest, the past premier of Quebec, was also there. And she told our delegation, guys, I have to talk to Jean Charest. And we said, Minnie Molly, why? And she said, because he's here promoting the Plan Nord. And the Plan Nord is a plan to develop northern Quebec. It's a plan that will affect the area where I live. It's a plan to build roads and to mine and to extract other resources. And I want to tell him how my community feels about this plan. So we tried talking to people and we were very lucky. We were able to get her into a meeting with Jean Charest. And at this meeting, Minnie Molly delivered one of the most beautiful speeches I have ever heard. She told Jean Charest that it was really important that the Inuit, her people, play a role in the development decisions that affect their land, because their land is part of who they are. And she also told him that it's essential that all development in northern Quebec be environmentally sustainable. As Minnie Molly spoke, everybody in the room fell silent. Nobody could believe that this young girl had the courage to tell Jean Charest how, he re how she really felt. While we were in Rio, we also spent some time lobbying. So just to give you some context, world leaders from all sorts of countries had gathered in Rio and they were writing a document together called The Future We Want. And in this document, there was a chapter called Priority Areas. And in that section, the world leaders were going to agree, what are the biggest areas in sustainable development that we need to address? And my delegation wanted to make sure that the future of the Arctic was going to be on this list. So we decided we needed to speak to these leaders who had gathered there to work on this document. And personally, I was really frightened to do so, um, because they're these really busy people in fancy suits and quite important, like ministers of environment from all over the world. And I was really frightened, but my friend Andrew said, Jessica, we're here in Rio, we have this really important message, you're just going to need to pick up your courage and go. So I did, and we started talking to these people in the hallways, and it was so surprising how many of them were interested in our story and how many of them cared about the Arctic. And our hard work paid off. We were actually able to convince the government of Finland that the, the Arctic needed to be added to this list of priority areas. And Finland convinced the entire European Union to go to the United Nations and say, guys, the Arctic needs to be on this list. And this was so exciting for us. We didn't think we were going to be able to convince any country to do what we thought was necessary. But we convinced the entire EU. Now, unfortunately, countries including our very own, Canada, said, no, we don't want the Arctic on this list. And now, the Arctic is mentioned nowhere in the document that came out of Rio. Now, we don't think this means our delegation didn't do anything. In fact, we're pretty proud of everything that we accomplished. In the 20 years that the United Nations has organized conferences on sustainable development, not one of them has talked about the Arctic. And we were the only group at Rio trying to raise awareness about this issue. 
So we're quite proud. And I guess the message I want to leave you with today is that if there is an issue that you're passionate about or something you're concerned about, you should talk about it. Because right now, the adults running this world are doing a terrible job of talking about what's important. <laughs> I learned a very important lesson in Rio from a man named Jean-Michel Cousteau. He's a famous French explorer who has dedicated most of his life to protecting the ocean. And my delegation met Monsieur Cousteau at an event, and we told him, Monsieur Cousteau, how do you do it? We're getting so frustrated talking to these people. They're so hard to convince, and they're so frightening to speak to sometimes. It's really hard to approach them. And he turned to our delegation, and he said, and I've had to change his words slightly, but he said something like this, you guys shouldn't give a hoot about what us old folks think. You need to go for your dreams. And that's exactly what we did in Rio. And I hope my talk today will inspire you to do the same. Thank you.